Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 20, and we'll continue to study this uh, very unique portion of Scripture. It is, it, is a, uh, <clears throat> it is a first, as far as I know, maybe the only time recorded in the Bible where such a thing like this took place, where after the gospel had been spreading... It was now <clears throat> an occasion when several men come together in the providence of God, and they're going to be instructed. It's, it's, I'll, uh, I'll mention some of the interesting aspects of this meeting. We have been looking at, the, at verse 28 of Acts 20 uh, for the last couple of Sundays. We'll kind of expand on that a little bit. <clears throat> We're entitling this message today, Guarding God's Flock, and uh, <clears throat> it's, it, I think you'll be surprised at the emphasis that not just this passage, but much of the Bible, really, uh, the New Testament, push, puts upon the importance of, of uh, determining and examining what's being taught and and uh, guarding God's people from error. Error destroys people, destro destroys lives. I want to read the text to you today. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 32. <clears throat> he says, as he has gathered um, in a city that they, I don't know that there was a church already, but it's a coastal city. Paul is a little bit on a, on a time schedule. He has um, asked for the leaders of the church in Ephesus and possibly surrounding cities to, to come to him there in the city of Miletus, the coastal city. And there he wants to give them one more shot at some very critical instruction. Instruction that is not just tailored for their unique isolated situation, but instruction recorded in the New Testament for all churches of all ages and the leaders in those churches to know what God requires in any situation, in any continent, in any time frame or generation. These are critical truths that don't change. They're foundational things. We learn a lot about what we need and what we're like as people, as Christians, by what he says here to these men. And so I trust that we will do justice to this text. I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. Please follow along in your Bible. It, uh, it may be a digital version or a printed version, but it is apt to be more uh, engaging, and rem you'll remember it better if you use all your senses with your Bible open as we seek to work through this. Be on guard. For yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. <clears throat> and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God <clears throat> and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. <clears throat> I want to, I know I've said some things as we were in this the last two Sundays, but I don't know that I have clarified for you the setting of this conversation as it needs to be uh, presented. Uh, we do not know how many people came together from the elders, the leadership in Ephesus, we do have evidence that the, that church was probably responsible for 
establishing churches beyond their area there in Asia Minor. And it could have well been that some of the elders that were not living in Ephesus, but in nearby cities where the gospel had gone and where churches had started, but they all came together and uh, met with Paul. Along with that, <clears throat> there was also other men, seven of them besides Paul, that, had, that were traveling with Paul to this point. If you look with me up at verse 4 of chapter 20, it says that Paul was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, Timothy and Tychicus, and, Tro and Trophimus of Asia. So here we have, this is the uh, area around Ephesus. They, there were two of the men that were up here with that first arrow in the upper left, Berea and Thessalonica. This is the region of Macedonia. Some of the men came from Iconium and Derby. This was in the first missionary journey. This is where Timothy is from and uh, where Paul, in each of the successive second and third missionary journeys, where he went back through to strengthen those people, deal with problems. But there's three of those men uh, from that area that are here. <clears throat> Altogether, there's seven. This is something of maybe what we would call today the first church leadership or pastor's conference that ever was. They're meeting together in some sort of a facility there in this coastal city of Miletus. And these guys, the seven that were traveling with Paul, were not, that was not their destination. They were traveling to go on with him after they left this Miletus coastal city, after this meeting with the other men from Ephesus. They were on their way to Jerusalem. They had a deadline. They wanted to get there in time for a key a religious event. They, but they were mostly traveling because they were carrying a lot of resource. There had been a love offering that was collected uh, in the various churches that Paul had had seen start in the third missionary on the third missionary journey down in Achaia, Macedonia, <clears throat> and uh, we're thinking just about everywhere he went. I don't know that there's any evidence that he kept back the opportunity to participate in this first opportunity to support uh, Christian brothers and sisters in another area of the world that were going through a severe crisis, a famine and persecution combined. And so we don't know how much money, and they, but they had to carry this with them. They were transporting this, and so it's sensible that there were um, a number of men for security, but also so that they could go back to their own congregations and report that this had been successfully delivered and maybe give them some feedback as to what they saw in how critical uh, suffering was in the church there in Jerusalem. So there, there, is, there is a group of men some of whom had traveled with Paul a little bit before. Timothy had traveled with them before. But some of these men, um, th this is an exciting first. They're, they're meeting brothers and sisters in churches. This has never happened before in the history of the world. The it was, this was when the church was in its infancy. It was just spreading out through the Roman Empire by the grace of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And these men are key leaders in these places. They love Paul. They trust Paul. They've been learning from Paul. Now they're all together. They're meeting one another. I can just imagine the electricity and the sense of unique opportunity that this was for these men traveling together. Now they're in this conference. And they're meeting some more elders from, a, from Asia Minor. <clears throat> It's a very first, it's a, it's a new thing. It's also, there is, we learn 
from chapter 20, verse 22, that it had already been made known to them that this might be, even though it was a first of its kind, it might also be the last opportunity for them to ever, many of them to ever see their beloved mentor, the one that's probably led many of or all of these guys to the Lord. And they, and it says in uh, verse 22 and following of this chapter, and now Paul is speaking, he says, Behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. So this is a mixed situation. There's an excitement. They're, they're meeting one another. There's a brotherly bond in the spirit of Christ. But they also all have this in common where they're hearing this kind of anticipation that the, there's been repeated indications that where they're going is not just for the purpose of delivering resources to some very needy brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're also going to a place that something Something's going to happen in which Paul is either going to be killed, but he's going to undergo some sort of trial. We know later that he's arrested and that he, his freedom, his movements are restricted. He eventually does go back to Rome under house arrest. And there he is tried once and then later on, it's not recorded in Acts, but he's later beheaded. In, uh, by the Roman em emperor. So this is a, a unique meeting together. This passage, the Spirit of God, includes, has Luke capture the essence, the, the, the truths communicated to those men because these are eternal truths. These are things that our church needs. In fact, there is no church of Christ anywhere in the world in any generation since that does not. These are essential basics for any church. And so <clears throat> we're going to seek to answer two topics in this passage, verses 28 through 32. Two topics are going to be covered. We're going to. He's speaking to these leaders, but if, if you can see what he says to them, you can see that these are essential needs of God's flock. What he's giving to the leaders are for God's flock. We, we get a list of the things that are essential needs for God's church, for this church. Same exact things. And I know that Sunday after Sunday, people come, <clears throat> hopefully Sunday after Sunday, and uh, sermons are heard and they kind of disappear. I want to tell you that this is a unique opportunity to take note of the things that are, if we will note these things and not forget any of them, whether you're a leader in this church or you're part of the flock and maybe someday will be a leader, but it doesn't matter. All of us here <clears throat> need, to, need to comprehend and need to to remember every single one of these truths that outline what God says are the needs of any flock, of any church. Also here, there is the second basic topic, and that is the resources for the, for the flock, for the church. So pay attention. This has challenged me. I've had to... Uh, very seriously, think about, uh, am, I, am I 
am I doing right as a pastor? Are our elders understanding all of these um, areas of need? Are we addressing them? Are we personally engaged with this truth? <clears throat> now, the first need, well, I had another arrow there, Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And there they are in Miletus. So the first need, <clears throat> we saw this really more last week, but it's not different. And I want to just pull it together with you. And it is that shepherds, the leaders are to be shepherds. It says this in verse 28. That we're to be on guard, first of all, for ourselves and for the whole flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made or appointed, is the Greek idea behind the word made, appointed you as overseers. And so the leaders are to shepherd. And let me just, I won't put it up on the screen, but let me just remind you, and if you need to have me send you this, or you can always look at it on our website. Um, the first group that we need to pay attention to is ourselves. And under that, there were the, we, we need to make sure our heart is right before God. We need to make sure that our doctrine is correct before God. We do not have the liberty to pay fast and, uh, play fast and loose with truth. And then that relationships are correct in the home, in the marriage, and with, within the church. The, the New Testament is very, very clear about how uh, leaders are to model relationships and to govern relationships in the church. I'm sure that all of you who have been saved for any length of time have witnessed very tragic situations in local churches where it was, a, it, it was basically an explosion and people People left, and it was a wound, and some maybe even left the church altogether. But these are things the Lord knows, and He's given us information on how to, first of all, pay attention to ourselves. And that's deep, uh, deep uh, consideration, introspective consideration. And then last week we saw the other thing in shepherding. This is a need for the church. The church needs uh, overseers, pastors, leaders who will um, consider the needs of the flock. And there were three things there that we saw. First of all, we noted that there was a mandate that these are not guys that ran for office. They did not have a popularity contest. An elder is, a, is supposed to be a man who's qualified according to the list of things in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. But ultimately, it is the Spirit of God that prepares a man, gives him the burden for this, this kind of a ministry, and will see, he will seek to work in harmony with other men, mature men in the leadership of their local church. So there's a mandate because the Spirit of God has appointed us to this, not people. And then there's the model here of the shepherd. This probably was a lot richer and more thoroughly understood in their time, I don't know that anybody here has ever been uh, officially a shepherd in uh, having a flock of sheep that they year-round cared for and, and moved from place to place. But uh, that's a rich, old, from the Old and New Testament, a rich picture for those people that communicated. <clears throat> and the shepherd was involved in caring, feeding, and guarding People. And we didn't go into it much, but that point of what the shepherd does, we're now going to put, we're now going to zoom in on this in this port as we look at more of these verses. A good shepherd has to be alert for the predators and the dangers that are ever present for sheep, and we'll touch on that more. And then we noted last week in our dealing with uh, verse 28, that there is also the motivation to remember that God is the one that paid with his blood <clears throat> to purchase the church. Now, <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> the church is also, we need, let me turn my bulletin over to see what you're looking at. 
you can fill in your bulletin if you want as we go along with this. <clears throat> Another essential need of the church besides leaders who are shepherding them <clears throat> is leaders who are watchful and alert. Let me point out to you that in this text, <clears throat> it is such an emphasis. In the first part of verse 28, a, a Greek word is used that is translated pay attention to or be on guard, the first few words of verse 28. A different Greek word, but there's no significant contrast between it. It's just, it's just a, a, a method of being able to highlight the significance of this particular role. But then when we get down to verse 31, he says, uh, uses a different Greek word, a, a different verb, <clears throat> and he says, not just be on to pay attention or be on guard, but he says, be on the alert. And this, both of these verbs are in the present tense, which means you never cannot do this. You always have to be alert. You always have to be on guard. You always have to be paying attention. And we'll talk about why. <clears throat> but it's also a command. It's in, in the imperative mode. These are commands. There is no church anywhere in the world, certainly this one, where the leaders of the church and the church needs this. The church needs leaders who are attentive, who are perceptive to things that may come from uh, to come toward the church or come from within the church to, to square them with Scripture. <clears throat> now... <clears throat> When Paul says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. You might ask the question, was this something the Spirit of God just kind of, you know, supernaturally impressed upon him that this is what's coming, Paul? You need to tell them about this? Or was it a little bit more like what we would expect <clears throat> that it was more of a natural process. Let me tell you, the reason, that the Spirit of God may have certainly emphasized this to him, but there was also good foundation with what had already he had experienced in other places in the Roman Empire where he had gone to share the gospel and where churches had been established, where after he was there for a short time, Sometimes longer, he was a shorter time in Thessalonica and Berea, but a longer time in Corinth, and so it varied. But what didn't vary is that every single time the gospel was introduced into a town, and God's people, there were people saved, and a church, a little infant church was beginning, every single time that the shepherd, the, the apostle Paul, who was the first shepherd that they had, when it was time for the Lord to lead him out to another place, every time there's evidence in the New Testament that after he would leave, Satan would interject challenges. People would come into those places and would cause trouble. Paul had no doubt about this. False teachers would threaten this church as they had already entered the following churches. In, in, Thess, in, the first, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, in the church at Corinth, there is the evidence that they, <clears throat> after, he was, after he had departed, that they came in there. He says in verse 12, but what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which, we are, or which they are boasting. In other words, people will come in and say, you know what? I like, I like the way that they treated this guy, this apostle that came in. So they would present themselves as being an apostle where the Spirit of God had not done that. They were not apostles. They were false teachers. But they were after the status. They were after the, the prestige and the influence. It says, for such men are false apostles, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. They're false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No 
wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That was Corinth. Also in Galatia. Galatia was one of the earliest books written. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he writes to them, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him, capital H, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. This is one of those topics that Christians may find challenging because it's like it's negative. But did you know that this, uh, this particular theme is when you go through the entire New Testament and you look at the attention, the topics that are covered throughout the book of Acts and following, the number one topic that the New Testament is concerned with, more than love, more than any other topic, is the topic of guarding, against, guarding the truth, being prepared against attacks to the truth. And we're, we're going to see why. There's consequence if you, if you let in false truth or that which is false and not truth. <clears throat> so... Church at Corinth, church at Galatia, Jesus had made it very clear when he was here before the church was even established, but he told his apostles about this same thing in Matthew chapter 7, verse, 4, verse 15. He said, beware of false prophets who come in, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The word ravenous is, is, uh, is, is, is a very stark description. <clears throat> ravenous wolves. Peter, one who heard Jesus say this, who later, like Paul, was instrumental in the Roman Empire and especially working with those that were scattered in persecution to various parts of the Roman Empire, he writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, and he spends much of this, the purpose of this epistle is to give them the characteristics uh, of these false teachers. And so he speaks in these kind of terms. He says, that they are those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. That comes from chapter 2, verse 10. He describes them as unreasoning animals, verse 12. He describes false teachers in verse 13 as stains and blemishes. And in verse 14, as having eyes full of adultery, having heart trained in greed, accursed children. In verse uh, 17, he says, these men are like springs without water. Mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. In verse 19, he describes them as slaves of corruption. And the one that is pretty picturesque is in verse 22. He says, they're like dogs returning to their own vomit and pigs wallowing in the mud. Not flattering. But the whole point of Paul's writings, Christ's words, the New Testament emphasis is false teachers are going to come. You can count on it. God's told us about this. It's a problem. And it's, and it's serious. <clears throat> now, it did happen. In this particular passage, he is actually talking about, he says, I... I know that after my departure, this will happen. And we find out that it, it actually did. If you turn to Revelation chapter 2, you remember that one of the seven, the letters to the seven churches in Asia, the first one was to this church, the church at Ephesus, the men to whom he's speaking. And we read there 
that the, that the Lord says to this church, through, recorded through John the Apostle, what Christ said to the church at Ephesus, he said, I, I know your deeds. Now, this is, this is decades later, but this is what actually happened now looking back. He says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you, you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. In other words, these, these elders, these men that were now meeting with Paul in Acts chapter 20, they took this to heart as we should. And sure enough, according to this, in the years to follow, there were false teachers that tried to come to them with some new thing or some slant on something else. And they were perverting. They were twisting. Their motives were not up front, but they were having the same potential danger for God's people of misleading them. And they were apparently very, very diligent from what God, the Son, says to, these, to this church in this letter. Now, he finds with them a, a problem with them, but he does commend them that they have done what Paul talked about. They have been good at standing for the truth. Their leaders served the, the flock well in determining what was true and not. And so they, Paul writes, <clears throat> when he writes to Timothy, this is before, chronologically before Revelation was written, and when he writes to Timothy, he, who is pastoring at the time in the church at Ephesus, same people. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says to him in his first epistle, As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Verse 3. Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. He names names. To Timothy, when he writes in this epistle in verse 20 of chapter 1, he says, Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. So you begin to see that what he is saying here ahead of time turns out that it was needed then. It's still needed today. Leaders who are watchful and alert. And some will come from within. Some will come from outside, but both are a danger. He says, after my departure, savage wolves will, will come in among you, not sparing. Others, in verse 30, will arise uh, from your own selves. In fact, it's possible that of the men that traveled from Ephesus down to Miletus for this little pastor's conference, you might call it, that some of those men secretly in their hearts had wrong motives. And it could have been that some one or more of those men later on proved to be the ones to whom this warning was given. Hard to know. He says that he compares these kind of false teachers. The Spirit of God uses terms that are violent, very graphic. He says they are like savage wolves. They don't spare the flock. 
In the book I mentioned a week or so ago by Philip Keller called The Shepherd Looks at the 20, at Psalm 23, Philip Keller says that he had heard of two dogs when he was a shepherd. <clears throat> he had heard of two, just two dogs that had come into a flock and in one night had killed 292 sheep in unbridled slaughter. One morning at dawn, Philip himself, with his own sheep, found nine of his choicest ewes, all soon to lamb. They were all just about ready to lamb, laying dead after a cougar had attacked the flock in the night. And from then on, Philip said that he slept with a loaded rifle and flashlight near his bed. At the least sound, he would leap from, from bed and dash out into the night to protect his sheep. And that is the picture that God wants us to get through what Luke is writing about what Paul said, that a good godly elder is going to be alert. He's going to be on guard. He's going to be, he's going to be diligent to know and to respond when there's a threat to the flock, God's precious flock. Leaders are to be watchful and to be alert. In uh, <clears throat> There is a description in a commentary about the Eastern, what the Eastern shepherd, his role was, and I thought it was a little bit more informative. The Eastern shepherd was, first of all, a watchman. He had a watchtower. He got up to a higher perspective to see during the light time of the day what was around the flock. Some of these Flocks of sheep were quite large, so you needed to be able to get up where you could see around. It was his business to keep a wide open eye, constantly searching the horizon for the possible approach of foes. He was bound to be circumspect and attentive. Vigilance was a cardinal virtue. An attack on an alert wakefulness was for him a necessity. He could not indulge in its fits of drowsiness, for the foe was always near. Only by his alertness could the enemy be circumvented. There were many kinds of enemies, all of them terrible, each in a different way. At certain seasons of the year, there were floods. Streams became quickly swollen and overflowed their banks. Swift action was necessary in order to escape destruction. There were enemies of a more subtle kind, animals, rapacious and treacherous, lions, bears, hyenas, jackals, and wolves. There were enemies in the air, huge birds of prey were always soaring aloft, ready to swoop down upon a kid or a lamb. And then most dangerous of all were the humans, the human robbers, bandits, Men who made a business of robbing sheepfolds and murdering shepherds. That eastern world was full of perils. It teemed with forces hostile to the shepherd and to his flock. Paul is saying, the enemy doesn't care. They're not shepherds. I, uh, <clears throat> I heard of someone recently a dog apparently got into their property and just had a, a killing frenzy, killing half of all of their laying hens, just slaughtering them, not hungry, just to kill, just ravenous, violent, having a great time just slaughtering these innocent little animals. The picture is that in the church, the one who is the father of this, Satan, he is the one that uses his servants, his people, and he's got them. The Bible says in 1 Peter that he is like a roaring lion seeking to devour 
But, but the way he does is sometimes is through false teachers that come in. They are not concerned about truth. They're not concerned about glorifying Christ. They are just destructive. So, leaders, the church needs leaders who are watchful and alert. Then, not sure how much we can deal with this one, but the church needs leaders who are, will tirelessly warn. In our text, <clears throat> Uh, it says in verse 31, Beyond the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish, is the translation of the New American, did, to admonish each one with tears. This word in the Greek is sometimes translated warn. It involves instruction. It involves uh, the aspect of explaining truth. It involves the idea of listening and understanding, but then giving appropriate responses out of God's word. But usually it's to show the individual who's in peril and need of admonition or warning that there is some sort of consequence. There's a danger. If you continue this way, if you continue with this course, there's going to be some sort of consequence. Sometimes the Bible tells us exactly what that is. But it is, it is the role for them to admonish. And he uses his own, his own uh, time with them, his own model. He says, you know that I, there was no time I, for three years, there were no hours that this was not done. Sometimes it was when it was inconvenient. Sometimes it was... Uh, it was a long, long day, but you saw me do this, and now I need you to do that for, with, in my absence. I need you to warn. And he says, with tears, he admonished them. He warned them with tears, showing his compassion, his concern for these families, for these individuals. It may not have meant that he was always, you know, uh, whimpering and, and crying to the degree that he almost couldn't communicate. But it does mean that his heart was tender and he wasn't just mechanical about it. His whole ministry was something more than a cold and heartless exhibition of truth, being warmed and animated by the tenderest affection toward them and a heartfelt desire for their salvation. I read about a pastor, a church, that had dismissed the pastor and had just gotten a new one. And so someone asked a person in the church why they had gotten rid of the old one. And the answer was, because he kept telling the people that they were going to hell. The questioner asked, well, what does the new pastor say? Oh, he keeps telling them that they're going to hell too. Well, what's the difference? Well, the person said the difference is, is that when the first one said it, it sounded as if he was glad about it. <laughs> and when the second one says it, you know that it's breaking his heart. By the way, parents, I think that there's a, a message here for us. Sometimes our children may perceive that they're a bother. They're disrupting our anticipation of plans. And the way we talk to them, we need to be one where they see our compassion is for them. Just like a good shepherd in the home. Now, this next point is critical. Up to this point, we have been seeing some specific roles, how it's to be done, what is to be done. But I think that as we go through these points, each one gets a little bit more significant. I'm going to keep you hanging on this one. I don't have enough um, to do a whole message on it, but I 
I do not want to skim over this particular point because we need leaders. The church needs leaders of this caliber. It always has been this way. We need those who are truly like a shepherd, who will warn, who will stay alert, who will not, no matter how long they've been doing this, they are keen, they know their people, they know their sheep, they, they see when something's not looking quite right and move a little closer to that situation. Not like we read last week, the uh, ones that were rebuked in Ezekiel, the shepherds, that it all become about what the people could do for them instead of what they could do for the sheep. I trust that you are noting the significance of this. This is one of those messages. This is, this is what our church needs. I trust that this is what our church has. This speaks to me. I trust it speaks to the other leaders in the church. But I also trust that this that, that you're a leader in some aspect, somewhere. This gives you some points on how God wants you to influence other people too. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we are humbled and sobered as we consider what was said to these men in that first pastor's conference, as it were. And Lord, the record of the New Testament tells us that this was right on target. Satan is active. He's pursuing those. If he cannot keep us from coming to Christ, he will seek to divert our attention and to destroy us even as God's children. And he has people that he can use to do that. Father, we live in a time compared to the New Testament that is so much more diverse in the nature of the threats. There are so many isms and factions. Our world today, our United States, the people in our neighborhoods, they are torn in so many directions. The schools have become a place oftentimes where they're indoctrinating children in dangerous things. Television is a key tool to promote bad values, bad philosophies, the example of very, very poor roles of men and women. And Father, we, we do not want to always be talking about just negative, negative things, but this is clear. These dangers are real. And you have, you have graciously given us the command and, and provided for us men that are to, in this day and time and in this location, to be these kinds of shepherds. Lord, we happen to have today with us church planters, those that are already in a community seeking to see a church established and others that are targeting a community to go to as soon as they possibly can. How exciting that the New Testament gives us all of these principles that they can use today in those places. And Lord, how, how those communities need good shepherds too. Father, we thank you that your grace is always sufficient. We are not adequate for these things, really. That's what Paul said. But by the grace of God, you help us. And, and through your grace, we can do what you require of us. Father, I pray for the leaders of our church. Lord, help us to be strongly united. Help us to be deeply focused upon pleasing our master, upon honoring him with truth. Help us to care for the people that you put into our charge in the manner in which the New Testament commands us to care. Lord, we thank you that we have a great shepherd, a good shepherd who uses the resources that he has provided if we will just see it and appreciate it. Thank you, Lord, that there is nothing that Satan can throw at us that will defeat your church. It will prevail. 
We will come through this time of our lives and through this age where we, every single one that has come to Christ is going to be delivered safely into the arms of God to ever enjoy that together. And there will be no threat there. There will be no ravenous wolves, savage wolves seeking to devour us. We will then be safe at home. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.